Okay, everyone, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so first, I want to thank everyone for being here. And before we get into it, I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful uh, for to have this opportunity to work on this land. Okay, um, so welcome everyone to What Comes Next, Equity and Transportation During and After COVID-19. Uh, today is about the formal launch of our new report on uh, transportation equity and COVID-19. And we decided to do something a little bit different. Instead of just rehashing the report in a presentation, we thought it would be more fun and more valuable to invite some of the scholars whose work we've drawn upon uh, to come give us their perspectives on transportation equity coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm really excited today because we have a true cross-country group uh, who are gonna be presenting today. But before we get into that, I just wanna briefly explain for those. Whoops, did I just mute myself? Sorry guys. Um, did you, what was the last thing you heard? It was just the last couple words, Matt. Okay, great. So Mobilizing Justice is a partnership of over 30 institutions, and we are committed to advancing transportation equity through research and knowledge mobilization. Our partnership spans academic uh, institutions, industry, the nonprofit sector, and multiple levels of government. Uh, we, for those who are new to Mobilizing Justice, if this is the first time you've heard about us, I encourage you to check out our website at mobilizingjustice.ca. And if you're interested in attending more of our events in the future uh, or getting involved in some other way, the best thing to do is to sign up for our newsletter. And don't worry, we won't spam your inbox. It's just once a month at the end of the month, we like to send some updates about what researchers in our partnership across the country are doing. So the way you can do that is go on to mobilizingjustice.ca, scroll down to the bottom of the main page, and then enter your email down here in the newsletter form and hit subscribe. It's very simple. Um, and so just a great way to hear about some upcoming events that we'll be having. So as I said earlier, um, we are formally launching a report, uh, a review on the implications of COVID-19 for delivering transportation equity. Um, how this report came about is we hired two wonderful grad students at U of T, Hannah Dos Santos and Lisa Chiche Lima, who are both in the geography and planning department. Uh, as our core research team, and we, we did a somewhat systematic overview of about 175 studies, reports, and research articles that um, these students developed into an annotated bibliography. And I just wanna thank Hannah and Lisa for their work. Um, I don't know if they are here today. I know they're both close to graduation, so uh, perhaps not. Um, and if you're interested in that annotated bibliography, we've published it on our website as well. So mobilizingjustice.ca forward slash data sets is you can access it there. So um, we did a whole bunch of readings so that you don't have to. So if there's a citation in the report that uh, is of interest and you want to follow up, you can, you can check the annotated bibliography. Um, COVID-19 tr transformed our already very splintered urban society in many ways, right? Different communities were impacted unevenly and unequally, um, it, depending on the modes that people used, the amount of resources their community had. And so we actually found it really problematic to try to formulate our review into a single overarching narrative. So what we did instead is our report is really uh, 15 briefs, research briefs that have been virtually stapled together covering a, a wide range of topics. So the first set are, are mode specific and they look at COVID-19 and equity with respect to different travel modes along with overall system safety. We also looked at how different aspects of society have changed. And we also looked at 
different communities and how different communities were impacted in different ways. Um, I want to take a moment and recognize all of our co-authors. So Hannah Dos Santos, Lisa Abchiche Lima, Kate Hosford of Simon Fraser, Elise Comieu, uh, Professor Bruce Newbold, Professor Tim Ross, Professor Megan Winters, and Professor Michael Widener. So if you are one of those people, if you could just unmute and give us a shout out. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> okay, folks are shy today, that's fine. Um, before we turn to our panelists, I wanna talk about two recommendations that come out of the report. Um, I know how it is in out there in the world. Uh, folks are very busy and maybe you don't have time to sit down and read through the whole report. Uh, we have also published alongside the report, the executive summary is a standalone brief and I encourage you to check that out if you're short on time. In that brief, you will find uh, two of the main conclusions. And I just want to acknowledge that if you're in this room, chances are you already agree with these things, but COVID-19 has really driven home both of these points in ways that I think are important for us to reflect on and consider as we move forward. And the first is that transportation planning must consider diverse to live experiences when making decisions, right? Planners should anticipate and address the likely differential impacts of their decisions on equity deserving communities. You know, as you can recall, uh, if we go all the way back to May of 2020, in those early days, many decisions had to be made quite quickly, right? And not a lot of thought was given to uh, equity. So, you know, this was very pronounced with transit. Uh, suspending certain kinds of fare payment for safety reasons, like suspending cash fare payment, while still requiring fares, uh, created a barrier for some folks uh, who were digitally disconnected or who had trouble accessing um, fare cards. You know, advocates have long called for better efforts to address language barriers in transit even before the pandemic. A recent study by Diab et al. noted uh, in a review of transit agencies' COVID-19 communications that only 4% of agencies were communicating their COVID policy changes in a language other than French or English. Now, this is very important because, as I'm sure many of us in the audience know, newcomers to Canada are more reliant on transit and transit can be an essential lifeline for newcomers uh, trying to establish a foothold in Canada. And so the issue of communicating changes to COVID policies and regulations in, in only English and French presented a significant barrier. Uh, as another example, the decision to require rear door boarding presented challenges for many older adults and many people with disabilities. Um, taking all of these things together, th the point here is that policies can impact people differently depending on their lived experiences. And so for this reason, the lived experiences of people from equity deserving communities should be front and center in guiding decision making and practice. The second major finding from our report, also mostly about transit, not to pick on transit, is that the role of public transit needs to be re-examined as more than just a means of serving peak hour commuting, right? The pandemic really demonstrated that public transit is an enabler of every aspect of daily life. When the COVID-19 pandemic began um, about two months into the crisis, so around May, uh, my colleagues and I at U of T surveyed over 3,500 transit riders in Toronto and Vancouver. And one of the things that we did is we tracked how their primary mode of travel changed for different destinations. And these are some of the results we have. So what this uh, result here on the left is saying is that because of the pandemic, 89% of people who had been using transit to access recreation and exercise changed modes. So a huge mode switch, 
Same with social trips, 85% swing away from transit among people who were using transit for that purpose. And you'll notice over here, however, the swing is much lower for grocery trips and much lower for regular trips. Unsurprisingly, when we asked people who were still using public transit um, why and what the most important destination was, overwhelmingly people said things like grocery store and the pharmacy. In fact, those two things together constituted about two thirds of the respondents. And you can kind of see this coming out now in, in the fact that ridership in a lot of places where they track it by times of day has been returning faster in the off-peak periods than in the on-peak periods. And so we're hearing a lot now about the importance of public transit use beyond just the peak hour commuter. And I think that's something important for us to keep in mind as we start to envision uh, the post-pandemic transit system uh, of the future. And so that's just my overview of the report. If you would like to read it, I have dropped the link to it right here in the chat. And with that, I am really excited to introduce four speakers uh, whose work we have been drawing on in conducting our analysis. Our uh, first speaker is Jamie Fisher. She is a PhD student at Simon Fraser University. Uh, Jamie, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm just going to do an awkward screen share. I have two screens here, so it takes a minute. Oh, I don't have sharing permissions, actually. <clears throat> There you go. Okay. You see, not my notes, just the screen, the, the PowerPoint, perfect. Okay, so thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm just gonna start by situating myself. I am sitting on the unceded ancestral and traditional territories of the Sinemoc Nation, and you may hear us West Coast folks saying unseated a lot, and that's because a huge proportion of British Columbia is not covered by any pre-Confederation treaty, and so unseated is just another word for stolen. Um, and I work and study um, on the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Coquitlam nations um, on Burnaby Mountain. Um, so I'm a PhD candidate in the city's health and active transportation research lab led by Dr. Megan Winters, um, who was mentioned in Matt's intro. Um, and my research focuses on bicycle infrastructure, equity in bicycling, and the impacts of using big data on bike ridership in research and planning. Um, I take a very spatial lens in my work, and as was the case for so many of us, my research totally pivoted during the pandemic to look at what was going on. So I'll briefly touch on three things that I've worked on. Um, and the first is a street rail locations project that's mentioned in the reports. Um, and uh, we did this work looking um, at the rapid response phase of COVID-19. So what was happening in the very first wave? Um, so in the rapid response phase of the pandemic, cities across the world were installing street rail locations to support a massive um, increase in demand for active transportation. And so these were things like pop-up bike lanes, slow streets, and anything else that diverted uh, street space away from motor vehicles and gave it over to people using active transportation. And then at the same time, cities were scrambling to make these installations. Um, there was guidance coming out from groups like NACTO and the Federation of um, Canadian municipalities around equity in street reallocation provision and how cities might go about doing that. And so this was really um, a response to that. And the case study um, was a spatial equity analysis looking at where street reallocations went and what types of neighborhoods had access to them. So we did this work looking at three mid-sized Canadian cities. Again, this is a different context than we're used to seeing as well. A lot of the research on bicycle infrastructure and ridership comes out of large cities, um, but we've learned that there's a completely different context in mid-sized cities. The geography is very different. Um, and then just in the interest of time, I'm just going to highlight the key findings because we do have um, a, an accessible story map that we've made for this paper that you can go around um, and click on the maps and, um, and get a good overview of the work on the Canadian cities. 
So um, for our spatial analysis, what we found was that the bulk of street reallocations in these mid-sized cities happened in core areas um, with the highest population densities. This was not surprising um, given that the goal was to make more room for people and these were the most crowded places in the city. Um, but what this meant was that there were inequities in provision um, if we're considering things like mobility and access. So um, the locations in these mid-sized cities in the downtown cores tend to have already great access to bike infrastructure and essential destinations compared to the outlying residential areas. Um, and so folks in the core uh, have more access to safer um, and more connected infrastructure. And then we did look at social equity too and found that there were inequities by age, race, and ethnicity, again, that ref um, kind of reflect the, the geography of these cities. Um, and the positive that we found was that lower income areas did tend to have more interventions. So that, that's a great thing. Um, we took away three main points from this work. Uh, the first was that cities with strong active transportation plans may have had more capacity to act in this context of a rapid response, um, but it also raised for us questions around how equity is actually handled in the plans themselves. And so there's work around being done around this um, now to try and understand how equity is conceptualized and operationalized in plans. Um, we also found that street reallocations may not have been serving those who were most in need of them. So the early response, again, focused on high population and high activity, but the approach was to act first and then engage after. This was not well received in a lot of communities. And in a sense, street reallocations acted as somewhat of a lightning rod around um, exclusionary practices, racism, and other harmful practices in transport planning. And so we're seeing more conversations around this today as well. So that's a great um, outcome. And then finally, we noted that evaluation of these interventions was essential, but data were very lacking. So we could learn from these as pilot projects, but few cities had any data on usage. Um, and so my recent work is speaking to this pervasive data gap on bicycle ridership. Um, recently, we tapped into Strava Metro bike volumes to look at cycling through COVID in Canadian cities. And so Strava is a social fitness app that's popular for its social network features and ability to track activities um, on your phone's GPS. And the app experienced major uptake through COVID because we were all apart. So people were exercising and connecting through the app. Um, and uh, what the data look like are aggregated and de-identified counts that are um, located to the street network and they're packaged up as ridership volumes that are continuous across space and time. So this map here um, shows you what that looks like. Um, and what, what we get is an incredibly detailed picture of where people are riding bikes. There are also labels in the data that um, now allow us to analyze ridership by age and gender, which is something we could not do in the past. And so again, we took um, this opportunity with this massive uh, increase to look at changes in the data as well as um, in cycling. And so Strava has been around for a while, um, and, but its major limitation is that it's a sample of all bicycle ridership. So it does not represent all people riding bikes. I already noted that uh, women, maybe I didn't, but women have been historically underrepresented in Strava data. Um, and this is true for older and younger bicyclists as well. So when we want to use Strava to understand cycling, um, it's important to, to be thinking about this bias. Um, the first thing that we tend to do uh, when we want to work with Strava is a correlation analysis. And so what we did in this work was uh, we looked at the change in correlation over time between 2019 and 2020 in response to this um, app uptake. Um, and so we split the data up by trip type and we looked at subsamples for women and older adults. And the big takeaway here was that, um, takeaways actually were that um, increased app usership led to increased better representation of all people riding bikes. Um, and the women's sample in fact was the most representative. And so this is important because um, we're seeing better representation of women in big data that's increasingly being used. But we may also um, use this subset purposefully um, for planning and analyses because it's likely less biased towards um, app users. And so that's what we did in this final analysis I'm going to share. So we analyzed spatial patterns of bike ridership um, during COVID-19, that first wave, um, again, in Vancouver. So first we checked correlation and how that changed. And then we looked at spatial patterns in Vancouver. 
So Vancouver was another city that made major street reallocations. They added about 40 kilometers to their network. Um, and so we were interested in understanding like where did people ride? Uh, was Vancouver's extensive bike network important in supporting cycling even with lower traffic levels? And also um, did street reallocations work? And so um, I mentioned we used the women's subsample and then a spatial clustering analysis to look at spatial patterns of change. Um, and so we mapped hot and cold spots where cycling increased or decreased. And then we overlaid those hot spots um, with street reallocations and bike infrastructure to see if they co-located. Um, and so to answer our research questions in short, yes, infrastructure mattered a lot, um, even when there was way less traffic. And so um, we picked up significant increases um, in residential areas and along recreation routes, especially along the seawall and through Stanley Park. And of these um, massive increases, 72% um, were on um, high comfort bicycle infrastructure. Um, and then when we factored in street reallocations, nearly 100% of all the streets that had um, significant increases um, had provisional or pre-COVID bike infrastructure. And then the spatial patterning in the map is kind of what we would expect. We see major declines in the downtown core. And so this is kind of pointing to a trend or a change in the type of bicycling that people were doing during COVID-19. Um, we found that slow streets in the hospital district and um, those slow streets that increase connectivity to local, um, local greenways were very well used. They had significant increases as were slow streets that increased access to the seawall in Vancouver. So um, any slow street that sort of supported recreation as well as those that increased mobility in the hospital district were, were well used. And then of course, um, if you've looked at the report, you may have seen the wildly successful B. Jav Stanley Park Street reallocation. These have since become permanent um, and Strava data were so detailed that we could actually pick up exactly where uh, the closure on the seawall was and where uh, bicycles were diverted onto Beach Ave. And so that was um, kind of interesting to see. Um, I just wanted to quickly show you how you could also use Strava um, to identify what have been dubbed Strava Desert. So these are areas with very low or no Strava bicycling. So this is a map of absolute change through the pandemic, through that period of the first summer, the first wave. Um, and what we can see here is that in the south and east uh, of Vancouver, there's very little change relative to everywhere else. Um, and so this is kind of like a dark spot is what I was calling it. Um, but uh, in Vancouver, uh, inequities and in access to low stress bike infrastructure have persisted in this area of, uh, of the city for over a decade. This was documented by other folks in the Chatter Lab. Um, and so I think what Strava can show us as well is um, uh, areas where spatial inequities in bicycle ridership um, may not have otherwise been visible. So just to sum up, um, building on the lessons learned from COVID-19 street relocations, we're now seeing there's a lot more attention um, to public space and how it's used, uh, and especially for active transportation. Um, so hopefully we're moving toward more street relocations to support a greater diversity of modes. Um, and in that vein, there's been a major shift towards e-mobility. And so whether that's e-bikes or e-scooters, these are offering more choices to a greater diversity of people who are also using these facilities. And so depending on the context, um, this uh, variety of modes on bicycle infrastructure um, may be a win or it may be um, a challenge area uh, depending on how busy the infrastructure is. So it's just an, another change uh, that we've seen rapid um, growth in. And then um, I would say oh, we need to consider post-pandemic bike trends. Um, as we saw, the recreational ridership was super important during COVID. And I think with more teleworking, more non-commute trips are going to be important. So building out infrastructure in, um, in a more connected way that brings uh, neighborhood connectivity into the picture is really important. And then um, there is room uh, to improve on the gender equity advances we saw in the bicycle data and ridership. So we saw that um, the gap in, in um, gender disparity in women's cycling might have narrowed in our study cities at least, and that women's representation in big data improved. And so I think these are things we can carry forward and keep working towards um, as we emerge. And I do have some links that I can drop in the chat once I stop sharing my screen. So thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Jamie. And uh, I just need to make one quick correction. Um, that is a PhD candidate in Faculty of Health Sciences. Um, uh, I, having been there, I, I know that uh, that's an accomplishment. So. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I'm one year out. So one year out from finishing. It's, it's yeah. Well, I think it's you're doing fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Jamie. Uh, up next is Dr. Jacob Al Hassan. He is an academic co lead for the University of Saskatchewan's Global Health Program, and he is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry there. Uh, go ahead. Thanks very much. I'm just going <clears> to, <throat> like Jamie, try to share my screen and then um, see if it works. Okay. Does it work? Everything good? Okay, fantastic. Yeah, so thank you so much for inviting um, us, especially, you know, inviting early career folks to have this conversation, I think is especially important. Um, most of the work that I'm going to be presenting on is more um, pre-pandemic, but hopefully there's lots of lessons in there. So um, I'm actually joining from Saskatoon on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. Um, and I'd like to share some of the work that we've been doing on intercity transportation and health and some of the implications of this for sort of a post-pandemic kind of context. So in May 2017, the Saskatchewan Transportation Company, which was a public bus company created in 1946, was closed by the Saskatchewan government to reduce a budget deficit. Um, just before the closure, the STC had a fleet of 41 buses. It covered 25 routes and it connected about 253 communities traveling about 2.8 million miles per year. Um, the government gave different reasons for the closure, including that it would save $85 million in the next five years. And I'm going to show um, in this presentation that the decision and its logics were problematic because it is unjust um, and also because it has caused poor health outcomes um, within the population. So without getting into too much detail, I have presented this figure to show how the STC closure was connected to deeper political histories. So you may be wondering why a health researcher is so interested in politics, but my research was guided by a theoretical framework in health that's called the political economy of health, which asserts that health differences in the population are often caused by political choices, including decisions to invest in or defund public services. And so after some oscillation between liberal and conservative rule, the 1944 electoral victory of the Saskatchewan Cooperative Commonwealth Federation or CCF under Tommy Douglas represented a paradigmatic shift in Saskatchewan politics and beyond because the government prioritized investment in public services. And this approach was broken in the 1980s by the election of governments that pursued various new liberal austerity policies. So this new policy orientation was um, guided by neoliberalism, an ideology that prioritizes the market over human health, sustainability, and justice concerns. And so the research that I'm talking about here today, explore the politics of the STC closure and the health and health equity implications and impacts of the decision. Um, it relied on 47 days of parliamentary debates, interviews with 100 former bus riders, um, focus groups, sex focus groups with health system and social service workers. Um, and so some of the lessons that you know, I'll be drawing out here might be useful for the potential post-pandemic sort of austerity that may follow throughout the world. Um, so exploring the politics of the STC closure was a fascinating exercise. Um, one of the most striking observations in perusing the parliamentary Hansard on the STC closure was how the bus was initially presented as safe from closure in 2016 and how the government shifted its position and started asking if it was really its duty to provide public transportation. This was followed by complete normalization of the closure. And I want to present in the next slide a sort of autopsy to show the debate that determined the fate of the bus. So the government used several tactics to defend its decision to shut down the bus, um, including minimizing the importance of the bus, portraying it as a burden, and using other economic sort of logic. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to describe a couple of these, right? So to justify the STC closure, the government portrayed the bus as an unused service. So this involved essentialization, minimization, and outright negation of the value of the bus system to its thousands of former users. 
it emphasized the government's, and I quote, ridership decline over the years, um, the buses ridership decline over the years, and dismissed claims by the opposition members of the Legislative Assembly that the closure could have negative consequences as, and I quote, scare tactics, and claimed that the closure would mainly affect former employees and their pensions. In fact, this framing was repeated throughout um, the parliamentary debates. And this actually ignored the almost 200,000 former STC users who would be affected by the decision. As the arrows show, the opponents of the closure portrayed the bus very differently, right? So I'm going to speak only about the portrayal of the closure as ideological. That said, opponents use many other arguments, including environmental sustainability and human rights concerns. So according to the opponents of the closure, the STC closure was ideological involving a toxic combination of neoliberalism and colonization and therefore requiring careful analysis to understand. Um, a member of one of the focus groups actually noted that the closure, and I quote, has totally deregulated transportation and the culture of safety that we had under, uh, under the STC. Um, the STC closure was also problematized for being colonial and anti-environment because many former riders were indigenous and because the decision would lead to more cars on the road. These arguments sort of reveal the complex ways that politics can be a threat to health, mobility, justice, and environmental sustainability. Since at the end of the day, ideological inclinations prompt um, scientific evidence and reasoning, and the bus was shut down, leaving thousands stranded. So there are typical ways that the transportation health relationship are represented. And I sought to sort of broaden these by placing politics more squarely in the picture. So as you see here, I paid attention to political ideology and drew on intersectionality theory to sort of explore how combinations of oppressions might exacerbate the closure impacts for some particular population groups. And so I'm going to describe in the following slide sort of the health impacts of the of the closure of the STC, contrary to the government's claims that the decision would have no negative um, health implications. So the research sort of revealed several health, social and environmental impacts. And while some of these impacts are quite common in transportation research, there were some STC closure impacts that were somewhat novel with implications for a post pandemic world. So for example, many research participants missed hospital appointments due to the closure, and this is a common transportation health connection. But I also saw health system closure impacts that the government had failed to account for, given that the bus formally transported vaccines and medicines. So one pharmacist in a focus group actually said, and I quote, now we're having to rely on private courier services. Sometimes it's frozen, in the summer it's too hot. We're throwing out thousands of dollars of medication. We never know when medication is showing up. It's really hard to tell someone with cancer that you can't have your medication today because your drugs didn't show up. And so we can imagine what this means for a world where um, vaccines need to be transported very quickly in response to all sorts of um, pandemics or emergency kind of situations. Um, the closure has also had many psychosocial health impacts on people who cannot travel anymore. And such people experience loneliness, stress, and a loss of independence. And one participant noted, that with the closure, she feels, you know, hopelessness, cut off, isolated, disconnected. Many participants highlighted environmental concerns. And this quote by a 21-year-old is now etched in my memory. He made it clear that being forced to buy a vehicle as an environmentalist is, and I quote, like if a vegetarian was forced to eat meat. So the research findings led me to a new framework, a web of dispossession to complement the initial framework. So, you know, an extensive discussion can be seen in the, um, the paper that I have posted up there. But the framework basically reveals that the STC closure impacts are not siloed or always direct, but often operate as a web. And the idea here is not just the multiple levels of impacts, but the issue of entanglement associated with a web, right? So the web of dispossession reveals that impacts of transportation budget cuts um, move beyond the individual to disruptions of social life, right? So at the center of the web, we have the former bus riders themselves. Many of them have been forced to hitchhike, miss hospital appointments, forego um, visits with their family, et cetera. Um, and given that most of them are connected to other people, that, that's their family, who don't want them to bear the brunt of the absence of a public service, the family members become caught in the web, so to speak, as they try to help the former bus riders access services. So here, for example, the family member may drive long distances to help the former rider or feel some of the stress, worry, and anxiety 
experienced by the former bus rider. And in some cases, the family member <clears throat> may be unable to provide transportation themselves, and some other community member has to step, step in um, to offer support and bear the driving burden. So people trying to offer this kind of help may do so at their own personal cost. And so disruptions in the health system and environmental concerns all illustrate how all of us could be affected by the loss of a bus, which was framed as affecting only 250 former employees. So the closure of STC shows in the words of Ted Schrecker how politics makes us sick and the closure impacts have been multiple and varied and affect more people than we realize. And it remains a threat to health and mobility justice. Um, so this project sought to travel the long road from politics to embodied health inequities by showing how one announcement to close a bus company in Saskatchewan's legislative assembly has dramatically changed the lives of the most marginalized in the province. And let me end here with the quote um, by former Colombian Mayor Enrique Peñalosa that public transportation is a powerful democratic symbol and a developed country is not a place where the poor have cars, but rather one where even the rich use public transportation. Thanks. Jacob, I wanna, I wanna thank you so much. Um, there's a lot to reflect on in that that I think is very relevant uh, given subsequent closures in inner city bus services that we saw during the pandemic. Um, really important work, thank you. Up next is Dr. Ignacio Tiznado Aiken. He is a postdoctoral fellow and research coordinator of the Suburban Mobilities Cluster here at the University of Toronto. Ignacio, the floor is yours. Thanks, Matt. I'll be sharing my screen. Okay, so hello everyone. Thanks for being here for the invitation. Um, it's really nice to see like different research uh, connecting transportation equity and the pandemic with so many different angles and perspectives. Uh, today, my presentation will be about uh, motives behind prospective public transport use uh, after the pandemic in Canada. So we all know that the pandemic has generated a diversity of impacts in almost every dimension of every, our everyday lives. And besides and like the obvious health and economic impacts, countries worldwide, not only Canada, have been experiencing a dramatic decrease in mobility levels for all travel purposes and all transportation modes, but particularly a, a decrease in public transport ridership Given the image, uh, particularly at the beginning, as uh, public transport, a place where social distance and preventive measures could be difficult to achieve, uh, being a possible focus of contagion, uh, particularly in the first stages. And as an example, if we look at the TTC ridership data over the last two years, uh, we can see that the, at the start of the pandemic, the ridership was about 15 to 20% of the pre-pandemic levels. And at the end of the last year and the beginning of this year, uh, the DDC um, reached around 50% of the pre-pandemic levels. So considering this kind of very uh, general background, we, we situate our study within the rising literature about uh, COVID and public transport. Uh, there was a lot of study at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, focused more in, on general challenges, uh, reflections, or research agenda. And then more specific studies uh, took place analyzing public transport uh, among different population groups uh, in different contexts, and also analyzing uh, overall trends in model share. So our study aimed to analyze uh, trends and reasons uh, behind the prospective public transport use through a large sample um, of the survey that Matt already mentioned at the beginning uh, in two large Canadian cities. So mainly we asked ourselves, uh, ourselves two main research questions. The first one was uh, after the COVID ends, will people continue riding transit? And the second one, what were the reasons behind increasing, maintaining or decreasing uh, public transport use? So as I said before, to answer these very specific questions, uh, we use a public transport and COVID survey applied in Toronto and uh, Vancouver. Uh, 
So we had uh, two different waves. Wave one was uh, restricted to adults who took transit more than once uh, a week uh, pre-pandemic. And then wave two um, uh, last year uh, captured changes in travel, in travel behavior before and anticipated um, effort in late spring uh, regarding vaccination. So from this very large uh, survey, uh, wave uh, one, nearly 2,000 people answered wave two. And in this way, we use an open question uh, where uh, 1,400 people said a little bit about the reasons behind their prospective public transport use. So the specific question that we use in this case was, um, how strongly do you agree or disagree with the following uh, sentence? After the crisis, uh, crisis ends, I will probably write transit less than I did before COVID. So that was our main uh, objective in this case. So how we analyze the data, we use two main techniques. Uh, first, we use text mining. Um, we had a wide diversity of answers. Some of them were very, very short. Other were very, more like very long and detailed. So we first used some frequency plots to see like the most used words and words associations as well. But then we tried to analyze like sentiments behind those answers. So for that, we use an emotion classification from NRC and this allowed to associate words with eight basic emotions, anger, fear, anticipation, trust, surprise, sadness, joy, and disgust. And therefore we had a first idea of the feelings behind the decision to ride less or to continue traveling by public transport. And then uh, a second step of our methodology was based on a more uh, qualitative content analysis. So our members uh, extract like the main concepts or labels uh, attached to the answers, trying to code, um, creating a very comprehensive coding system, trying to extract the main themes and sub themes that were uh, in the data. This way we were able to uh, create some categories that emerge uh, from the answers and try to differentiate uh, this decision be, uh, behind traveling less or continue traveling by public transport. So I will show you a very brief summary of uh, the main findings. Uh, first, the, the sentiment analysis that I told you before. Uh, in this image, you can see uh, each emotion and the percentage associated. Uh, people who use less transit in, is in the figure above, and people who use less, uh, the same or more transit is at the bottom. So there's two main things that I want to highlight here. Uh, first, uh, we found that trust and joy were high on the emotion of people who won't be, living, uh, won't be riding less, which is an interesting result considering how transit has been usually portrayed as a very unsafe or inconvenient uh, mode of transport, especially during the pandemic. And second, we saw uh, more positive emotions for people who will be using transit and more negative feelings for people who will be changing to other transport modes, such as, for example, fear or sadness, okay? So what about the more detailed analysis that I told you before with this uh, qualitative content analysis with codes and subcodes? So for people who will be uh, using less transit, uh, we found several reasons behind that decision. Uh, some of them were more financial, uh, using new transportation alternatives, uh, employment and safety related reasons, and also an overall discontent towards uh, public transit. Some things to highlight here as well, uh, the most common codes for people uh, who will be using less transit after the pandemic fell under this new transport alternatives category and a switch from public transport to active transportation like walking or cycling had the most uh, significant amount of responses. And then in second place, uh, switching to personal car use. So this indicates like an overall, I would say surprising trend that shows that participants favoring uh, other active transportation modes um, do convenience and also sustainability implications. Um, aligned with the overall employment trend being a significant factor impacted uh, the pandemic and how people portray uh, his labor future, employment was also uh, mentioned by almost half of our sample, particularly about the, how the work from home dynamic uh, 
uh, will impact and generate in the future less travel. And finally, uh, regarding safety and health issues, uh, which is the, the uh, code four that you see in, in, in the table, uh, this was mentioned by around uh, a third of the, of the sample, reflecting on one hand like COVID or disease related concerns, but also some positive effects about using uh, active transportation modes. So in contrast, uh, people who will increase or maintain their transit use reveal different reasons. Um, you can see here a lack of alternatives, a need for traveling, affinity with transit, and also some environmental reasons. Um, and the most mentioned uh, uh, category in this case was the lack of alternatives, the needs uh, for traveling due to employment reasons, and also the reopening of activities. But it's particularly this code one, the lack of alternatives nearly double the responses compared to codes three and four. So this indicates that public transport use after the pandemic is primarily influenced by being constrained regarding transportation options. And of course, there's people that relies on transit for daily mobility. Uh, and this might suggest that in present for other options, maybe transit would not be the first option for many respondents, but of perform a key role in terms of uh, social equity. In another important category, captured like by all the responders uh, who believe that will be safe to return to public transport after the reopening, um, considering additional safety measures. And this code, uh, this code particularly can demonstrate that respondents trust in public health and COVID measures uh, and that uh, riding public transport can be a uh, safe public transport mode, different from the first image that we have uh, at the beginning about public transport. So jumping into the conclusions, uh, of course, our analysis uh, allow us to understand uh, a little bit the main motives behind this prospective um, public transport use in Canada. We identify several reasons, sentiments associated for people who will be riding less, equal or more. And of course, uh, we uh, identify people who rely on public transport no matter what the circumstances and also people who can choose alternatives, but may, uh, mainly because they um, have the possibility to uh, work from home uh, or access to uh, private modes or uh, active mobility. Uh, our next steps, of course, in this research, this is a very preliminary one, but we want to go one step forward and try to identify different user profiles considering social demographic information and also their previous actual and expected behavior. Just to end my presentation, some open questions that could be interesting for the discussion. Uh, first, how do you picture like this post-pandemic future regarding public transport? Uh, I know that particularly in the case of public transport, we have important challenges regarding coverage, finances, safety, equity. And second, uh, very related with this idea of identifying profiles, uh, do you think that maybe we should propose like very targeted policies for the groups identified? I'm specifically, uh, specifically thinking about people switching transportation modes and those who will be relying on public transport uh, after the pandemic. And that's all. Uh, thanks for your attention and look forward for our discussion. Ignacio, thank you so much. Um, some of those results are really, really striking, especially um, the sentiment and emotion difference between those who switch to cars versus active travel. Um, okay, our final presenter is Dr. Leah Ravensbergen, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Transportation Studies Unit at the University of Oxford. And the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you for having me. And yes, I, I'm currently at the University of Oxford, but I'm gonna be presenting some work today that I did when I was a postdoctoral fellow at McGill University. Um, and I'd like to just quickly acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Juliette Fournier and Ahmed el -Ganady. I'm gonna to talk to you today about mobility of care. So what is mobility of care? Uh, mobility of care is all the travel required to perform care work. So this is all the unpaid work that um, people carry out um, to maintain a household. So this can involve getting groceries or running errands, escorting children's or escorting older adults to let's say health appointments or something like that. 
Mobility of care is interesting to me because some people have argued that it's underquantified, undervalued, and rendered invisible due to gender bias in the way that we gather, interpret, analyze, and visually represent travel data. For instance, a lot of care trips can mistakenly be considered uh, trips made for leisure or for personal interests. A lot of travel surveys will have questions about shopping, but not really distinguish shopping trips that are for fun and shopping trips that are for the upkeep of the household. And sometimes care trips are short, so they can be hard to capture, and therefore they can be underrepresented in, in studies today. Whoop, I went too far there. So the research that I'm presenting today um, was a, an exploratory analysis of mobility of care in Montreal. We were just interested in understanding how significant this mobility was and who completes this kind of travel and how. So what we did was an analysis of the Montreal Origin Destination Survey. And yes, this was in 2018, so before COVID-19. Um, and we dist redistributed the trips in the OD survey um, to capture which ones are really considered care, following a method put forth by the person who coined mobility of care. And what we found is, first of all, mobility of care are very significant. We often don't hear a talk explicitly about care trips and transport planning, but they're really a large portion of daily travel. In the OD survey, 28% of trips were considered mobility of care. So that's biggest after the commute to work. What we also found uh, was that there's serious equity considerations in mobility of care. Um, if we look here, we see that uh, they're disproportionately completed by women. Um, so 32% of trips are completed by women compared to 25% completed by men. But it's not just about gender. There's also an income uh, variation in mobility of care. Here we see the distribution of care trips by gender, where the orange line represents uh, women and the blue line represents men, but also across income. And while that gap is significant across incomes where women do more care than and mobility of care than men, it's the biggest at the lower income end of the spectrum, especially in households earning $60,000 or less per year. So we know that uh, mobility of care is significant. We know that there's these interesting equity considerations to this type of mobility. Uh, so we also looked into how this mobility is done. And it turns out there's also some interesting sustainability implications as well. For instance, compared to uh, the commute to work, mobility of care is more frequently done by car and more frequently done by foot, but quite a bit less frequently done by public transport and by cycling. So there's clearly some barriers to public transport use and cycling when it comes to completing mobility of care. The hunch here is that care tends to involve carrying things. You've got groceries or you've got kids, and that might be considered easier to do in a lot of environments in a car or by foot than on public transport or by bicycle. But given this, some people do do care using public transport, um, and especially lower income families. In fact, regardless of gender, uh, families earning $30,000 a year or less tend to use public transport quite a bit more to do mobility of care. And this is where we also have the biggest gendered gap in who's doing that care. So um, with that, I'm sure you're all thinking, well, this is all very interesting. I've had, I haven't thought of care this way, but what does this have to do with COVID-19? And it's true that the results that I'm presenting today were from a survey that was distributed before COVID-19. But the reason I wanted to talk to you briefly about care today is that I think it's particularly important to think about care and to plan around care in a post-COVID-19 world or a COVID-19 world. I don't wanna to be too optimistic and call it post-COVID. Um, for instance, we all know this is one of many studies that have found that commuting patterns completely changed during the pandemic. A lot of people uh, were working from home um, and trips as some of the research showed today centered not necessarily around the trip to work, um, but other trips became more important. Care has always been significant and has always been essential, but even more so now in a COVID or post-COVID world. Um, and that's likely to continue, at least for a while. Across the political spectrum here, um, we can see that uh, people aren't necessarily keen to go back to commuting five days a week. So the significance of care and mobility of care is bound to be even bigger proportionately in the post-COVID world. Um, so that I know is very brief, but the quick take homes are that uh, mobility of care is significant. You know, in Montreal, they represent 28% of daily trips, and they're bound to be even more significant now in a COVID slash post-COVID world. There's also seriously equity considerations to mobility of care. Women, and particularly low-income women, complete the bulk of this mobility. Um, and that there's sustainability considerations to it too. If we want to be encouraging sustainable travel modes, such as public transit and walking and cycling, 
Uh, for public transport use especially, I think we need to think more seriously about how we can plan better around care. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you, and I can put a link to the full article in the chat. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, I think it's a really important point that you bring up and something I think across all of the presentations that really comes to the fore is um, the importance of non-work trips, of care trips, of health care trips, of uh, other trips related to, to health and well-being. And so with that, I'd like to open the floor up to the audience if anyone has questions for any of our panelists. You can go ahead and use the raised hand button. You can click on the reactions button on your Zoom tab and you should see the raised hand button right there. Are there any questions from the floor? Uh, Jean-Francois, go ahead. Hi, Matthew. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to, uh, a question for Leah about the uh, mobility of care. Maybe, maybe there's a, a white paper. Uh, um, I'm in charge of the OD survey in Montreal. And uh, I really, uh, when you said there's some missing data in there, I really, that struck a string, a chord. So I'm care. I, I'm, Wanted to know a bit more about how you you you, dis, you define which is care, which is not. That's a really good question. So part of the critique is that you know I think the example I gave is okay. Shopping trip is a trip on the OD survey, but we don't know whether those shopping trips are for leisure or for care. And I think you'd approach that kind of trip really differently if it were for leisure or for care, um, and your needs are different as well. Uh, so that's one key example. So what we did is uh, following um, an article from Sanchez de Madariaga, who works out in Spain, and I'd be happy to send you the full link. Thank you. She actually designed a travel survey around care, but really careful considered the different types of care trips that can take place. Um, and, and then compared um, what an estimate of using a more typical travel surveys like the O'Day survey, how you could redistribute it to see what care could look like. And using her survey that actually focused on care and comparing it to her estimate, she found that they pretty much correlated. So we were going on the basis of that estimate of recategorizing those trips. Um, so what we're presenting today is, is that estimate based on what is hopefully a good method, considering it was validated through, through the other survey. Um, but I'd be happy to send you uh, both of those links if it's helpful to you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, since there aren't a lot of questions, I'll go ahead and throw one out there. So policymakers are faced with a barrage of recommendations, right? Um, not all of which can be implemented. So I wanted to ask each, um, each panelist, what's one top recommendation or most important recommendation that would come out of your own work that you think is something that's most urgent for policymakers to address or consider? I can speak first. Um, I mentioned it at the closing of my presentation, but I think that continuing to build out safe and protected bike infrastructure that um, separates people from motor vehicles is a key, uh, especially considering the synergies are like, I'm learning so much about transit from the other um, presenters. So especially considering um, potential mode shifts and people, more people continuing to use active transportation. So that would be my top recommendation in my field. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, I'm going to pick on someone, uh, Ignacio. Yeah, I would follow uh, the comment of Jamie, considering that, like right now, I think that we are in a critical moment to decide like what is the right balance in terms of transportation priorities. And I would say that on one hand, we have like people who will be relying on public transport and we need to like try to resume ridership uh, levels uh, like the ones before the pandemic with the correct uh, coverage, frequency, reliability for those users that need the most. But also um, just to like uh, policymakers to decide like uh, uh, where to uh, put new infrastructure in terms of active mobility. 
And I think that that is not the only the case, uh, only in the, the case of Canada. Like if you see uh, countries uh, also in Europe and Latin America, they are also deciding a lot to put new uh, active transportation infrastructure to help um, this post pandemic future and also to provide like a more sustainable future. I mean, we, we can forget that we are in a very uh, delicate moment in, in terms of climate change. So as well, it's a very important decision to, to provide this kind of alternatives in this post pandemic world. Thanks, and I actually see two hands from the audience. So I'm gonna switch over to those. Steve, go ahead. Put my camera on. Um, I believe my first question is for Jamie. I apologize to everybody. I don't remember who did what, so I'll refer to the study. The study out in Vancouver regarding the cycling. Uh, two questions, and you covered one of them, and I might have missed it, about how the data was gathered. And number two, how much of it was recreation-based and how much of it was destination-based? And that's into work, the uh, the care trips, all those trips where it's in, in destination-based trips. I'm using my, I'm cycling to go someplace as opposed to recreation. So the data that I use were um, Strava GPS traces. And so those were collected, generated by people who were using the app. Um, so the best that I could do for the trip purpose was to separate trips out by recreation versus everything else. So our, Strava does not provide labels in the data for specific tri trip purposes, although that would be great. Um, and so, um, yeah, to answer the first question, it was Strava. To answer the second question, the best I could do is co-locate where changes were happening. So I couldn't say much about destinations, although it was very apparent that recreational ridership and um, destinations that would be like, amenable to recreation. So parks and green greenways and things like that were very important. And that's where more people were riding. Um, and so presumably it was like recreation rides that were scenic and lovely. Um, that people were participating in, you know, uh, which makes sense when a lot of folks were at home. But we did see like the spatial pattern was that it was a lot of the folks who live very close to the downtown who were more likely the higher income folks who are working from home that got to do this like riding in the middle of the day kind of thing like the, the temporal pattern shifts too when we look at Strava. So we see more off peak riding and things like that. So kind of answer your question, but I couldn't really get at the destination. Okay. So this isn't to pick on you. This is a bit of a follow up. But when this opened up, we talked about we talked about transit ridership in the Toronto when they switched to a non cash based fare and how that might have excluded people who didn't have the phone and the data in the app. And I know you talked about, you know, gender inequalities and representation and, and that sort of that, like, how do you get around that issue? Uh, so one of the concerns we just did a transportation master plan here in the city of St. Catharines here in Ontario. And you know, active transportation seems to be focused on cycling and it seems to be focused on recreation. And it's trying to get it out to an integrated network. And somebody mentioned earlier about transit. Uh, so anyway, that's more of a general observation, not necessarily pointed at you. Uh, I think one of the concerns, and this is a general observation is, as people are working from home and I'm sitting in my basement right now, and people aren't necessarily using transit, that the transit numbers may not come back. <sighs> What's that do for funding of transit and everything? Again, it's just a general observation. Like, how many people are, if transit is necessary for their use versus other people who have choice? And at this point, I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> I will say that, um, and this gets back to one of the points I, I made in the beginning, is we, I think the pandemic is still very much challenging us to rethink uh, public transit as, as being about all those other trips beyond work and uh, dealing with the funding that we had based on revenue from peak hour, and how to, how to reimagine transit systems and think about service delivery uh, with such a big shift in demand is, is I think the big challenge right now. I, I wish I had a good answer, but um, I'll say there's lots of interesting micro transit models that are coming online and being piloted. But since we are a bit over time now, I just want to give one last opportunity for Misha to go ahead and jump in and ask his question, and then we'll wrap up. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate it. Uh, well, thanks everyone for your presentations. They're very insightful. My, my question is for Ignacio. I was wondering, uh, did you notice any difference uh, in the decrease or the return to transit by transit mode? Like, is it people coming back 
uh, using buses or are they usually, is it the subway people who are coming back or not? Thanks, Misha. That's a really good question. Um, that's probably for our second second step in the in the research. Now we want to analyze like the differences because we have the information of wave one, we have wave two, and probably at some point we will have wave three, hopefully. So it will be nice to see those differences, not only like by in transit mode, but also by different population group, uh, groups and try to create these kind of profiles. For now, we just like made these uh, very general uh, categories um, without making any distinction between different uh, transit modes, as, uh, as you ask. Thanks. All righty. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And could we give another round of applause and thank you to our presenters, Jamie, Jacob, Ignacio, and Leah. Thank you so much for coming. Please check out our report at mobilizingjustice.ca. And um, yeah, if you have any questions on that, you can always email me at matthewpalm at utoronto.ca. And um, with that, thank you, everyone. And uh, have a good rest of your week. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks bye. everyone. Bye.